So good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session in the Shape Your Future series, where we're exploring the STEM career journeys of Australia's rising stars. Today, we're so pleased to be hearing from Dr. Yilian Chu. I'm Dr. Melina Hearn. Um, my background is I'm a physiotherapist. Um, I've worked clinically in rehabilitation, um, and I'm currently part of the Catalyst or IMNIS Catalyst program at the Academy of Technology and Engineering. I'm also a postdoctoral fellow at Macquarie University researching dementia prevention. Um, so it's welcome to everyone joining us online today. And as we gather around from, from around Australia, I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from which we meet. I'm joining you today from the land of the Darug people. I pay respect to elders past and present and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who join us online today. As we share and discuss our knowledge and practices, we acknowledge the deep knowledge forever embedded in custodianship of country. So before we get into this session, you will have seen that this is being recorded. This and all talks in this series will be available on the Stella YouTube channel for you to visit anytime. There is also a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions, do drop them in there and we'll get to them either during the talk or in the discussion at the end. There's also a chat function, but any questions should be put in the Q&A section. Finally, you will be sent some feedback, um, a feedback form after this session to the email that you registered with. Please let us know what went well and what you'd like to see more of in the series next year. So now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Yilin Chu to tell us how she came to be working as a neuroscientist. Now, Yilin has explored how learning and gaining new memories can change chemical signals between brain cells. She uses worm brains to understand these chemical changes, hoping that we can translate it to the much bigger human brain. This may change the way we manage and treat conditions such as neurodegeneration and chronic pain. I'm fascinated about your topic, Dr. Chu, and we can't wait to hear you present. So please start your presentation. Thank you very much, Malin. Uh, um, can you see my slides? Give me a thumbs up. All right, beautiful. I feel like I say, can you see my slides constantly? Um, hello, everyone. And um, it's a pleasure to meet you all virtually. I would also like to acknowledge country. I am joining you today from um, Ghana country. Flinders University has many campuses, but I am on the Bedford Park one, which is the land of the Ghana people. And I'd also like to pay my respects to um, elders past and present and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us today. Um, I think it's really important that we always do acknowledge that there is a great history of science in this country. Um, and there is a lot of knowledge um, and connection to the land um, that we always have to remember in everything that we do. So I just wanted to talk to you today about my journey um, as a and how I became a neuroscientist, um, and specifically how I became a neuroscientist who studies worm brains. So my topic today, like the title of my presentation, is learning about learning through the worm, um, and this is part of the worm brain. So let me tell you a bit more. So firstly, hello, my name is Yi Dan Chu. Um, I go by Yilia, and I'm a neuroscientist and geneticist at Flinders University. I work with worm brains to study how learning and memory is encoded in the molecules that are made in our brain. So I'm super nerdy, as you can probably tell. I like to take um, selfies with my microscope because that's what we do as nerdy neuroscientists, and I love my microscope. So what I'm going to talk about today is firstly a bit about what I do in my science, because I can't help talking about it. A little bit about how I got to this point, and I can tell you when I was a little child, I never imagined that this would be my life. And lastly, just a little bit about what it's like to actually be a scientist. So what here, here's my beginning about talking about my science. So I'm going to tell you a bit about what I do. So the first thing I want to talk about is pain. Now, pain is very unpleasant, but it is also very important. So, you know, if you touch a hot pan or if you stub your toe, that pain is saying, don't keep doing this 
because you're injuring your body. So short term pain is very important to stop us from constantly injuring ourselves. But what happens if pain lasts for the long term? What if there is a long term chronic pain? Now, this is not very good for our body. And so there are many ways that people have invented to try and treat chronic pain. And one of the most common ways is to use drugs that are called opioids. Now, I'm going to show you a, a graph here um, that demonstrates that the way that we currently treat chronic pain is imperfect, and specifically using opioids. Now, this is a little bit of a scary graph. Um, it's quite recent from the United States, um, and it shows the rise in overdose deaths, which are caused from taking these opioid drugs. Now, we've all heard of things like heroin. You know, these have a bad name in society. It's like a, it's like a terrible street drug. But what you may not know is that heroin is an opioid. Um, and there are other opioids which are used by people to treat their pain, which they become addicted to. And they can die if they overdose on these drugs. Now this is terrible because we want people's pain to get better, not for them to get addicted to and die from overdosing on these drugs. So we need a better way to treat chronic pain. So my strategy to look into pain is to try and stop short-term pain, which I said is very important, from becoming long-lasting. Now, there are many strategies to look at this. So this is just my way of looking at this problem. So let me explain in diagram form. So let's say you are a pain-sensing cell. It looks a little bit like this. It's a, it's a you know, your average brain cell or neuron. Um, if you sense pain, you go, ow. Okay. And you sense pain again, you go, double ow. Now, what happens if you sense pain over and over and over again. What happens is that this pain sensing cell undergoes a transformation. It becomes a sensitized pain cell. And now these pain cells have new properties. They are more responsive. The sensation they feel is more painful. It is longer lasting. And you might even start to feel pain in response to cues that are not normally painful. So things that aren't normal. So what I'd like to do is block the situation. So I want to block the pain sensing cell from becoming sensitized. And the way I want to do this is to identify the neurochemicals that are involved and the timing of this change. So as I mentioned, I think, I think pain is important because we shouldn't keep injuring ourselves, but having these sensitized pain cells, this is not good for our bodies. So this is the step that I'm trying to stop, looking at these neurochemicals. So how do I do this? So firstly, I'd like to take a little break to look at what, what I see the brain as. So I'm going to show you a few pictures of animals, and I will tell you how many brain cells these animals have. And you might be surprised. So this is my favorite bird. It is a sulfur-crested cockatoo. I used to see lots of them back when I lived in Sydney. They were in the parts of where I live and I just love them. So, you know, they are, they're very noisy and very intelligent birds. It might surprise you that they have two billion brain cells, two billion neurons. Now that's a lot. So many of you might have a dog at home and, you know, there are many types of dogs. There are big ones and there are little ones. Um, I'm just going to say the average dog. So the average domesticated dog has 500 million neurons. So, you know, that's less than a bird. So maybe that might surprise you. What about humans? How many brain cells do you think we have on average? So good news is we have more, we have more brain cells than a worm. We have a, sorry, than a, than a bird or a dog. We have a hundred billion neurons. So that's quite a lot. So I don't know about you, but I can't count myself all the way to a hundred billion. I prefer to do my um, studies on learning and memory and pain using an animal that has much fewer brain cells. And the animal of my choice is the worm. So this is my beautiful worm here. I'm going to tell you that these worms have exactly 300 brain cells. Now that's much fewer than most animals out there. And they can still do so many things. Um, you know, so 300
300 sounds like I sort of approximated that number, but it's exactly 300. Someone has gone there and counted. And I think that is really remarkable um, that, it, that we are able to identify all these brave cells and even name them. So the cool thing is with having a small number of brain cells is that we actually see how they're all connected to each other. Now that is really powerful because that means we can look at brain cells, not just as a single cell, but also as this huge network of connections, which is how we think they function. So I think the worm model is extremely cool. Now, I presented to you this question of how we could stop brain cells from becoming sensitized. Now, why would we use worms to answer this question? Well, if you're talking to me, I love worms, so I could give you a hundred reasons, but I will limit myself to my top three. So firstly, we could test the role of each neurochemical directly using genetic tools to basically knock out the genes for every neurochemical in the worm. And as us as humans, we look very different from the worm, but we share many of these neurochemicals. Now that's very cool. Secondly, the worm is transparent. In that picture I showed you earlier, you could see the insides of the worm, which is very powerful because we can then visualize each brain cell in the worm and look at its activity. So what's behind me in my zoom background is actually a picture of a worm where I've highlighted some of its brain cells here. So the fact that it's transparent means I don't have to remove any part of the one skin or bone or whatever to look at its brain. I can just look at it down the microscope. That's very cool. And the worm is not like, you know, a bag of cells or, you know, a single cell or, you know, anything like that. It's an animal, right? And it's a small animal. It has a small brain, but it has many complex behaviors that we can analyze. And we can direct these studies of their behavior to changing the way that their brain works. So we can tweak little bits of their brain and see how this changes behavior. Also, I think they are extremely cute. Let me show you some videos. So here's a video of a worm and that's its head over here and that's its tail. And this is an eyelash um, pick, which is literally someone's eyelash stuck to a stick. So if we prod the animal's head, it will reverse backwards. If we prod its tail, as you can see here, it'll happen at some point, it will move forwards. So we can use this escape response to study how the worm behaves. Now in this video I'm going to play for you here, I have put in a green fluorescent protein into every single one of the worm's brain cells. So this is the head of the worm, that's its tail. Like us, most of the worm's brain cells are concentrated in the head, but it has brain cells that go throughout the entire body. Let me show you this video. So here the worms all crawling around, and you can see that they have even this, um, you know, bunch of um, brain cells that go down their their body, kind of like a spinal cord. So that's super cool that we can look at every single one of their brain cells while they're just crawling around. So with worms, we can do two very exciting things. Well, more than two, but I'm just limiting myself. So firstly, we can activate specific brain cells with blue light. Now this sounds like magic, but we can put in a switch into the brain cells of the worm, and that switch can be activated specifically by a bright blue light. Secondly, we can look at brain activity in living animals. I showed you that video just then of the worms crawling with their green brains. We can even put them into tiny little, like, like almost like chips. And we can put the worm inside and we can flow through all sorts of chemicals and we can ask how those chemicals impact the activity of the worm brain. I'll show you a video in just a second. So I'm going to show you a video now about how we can use blue light to activate the worm brain. Okay, so the blue light comes on and the worm moves. Blue light comes on and the worm moves backwards. The blue light's going to come on again now and the worm moves backwards. So what we've done is we put the switch, this, this blue light activatable switch in cells that cause the worm to escape. So every time we turn those cells on, the worm moves backwards. So we can basically ask what the function is of particular brain cells by putting this blue light switch in them and turning it on. And now I'm going to show you a video of the pain cell becoming activated. 
So, okay, so look at this right here where the arrow is, is, is showing. I'll, it's looping, so if you miss it the first time, I'll, I'll point it out to you. Just look again at this cell. There we go, so it lights up. And it lights up when it becomes activated. So we can ask questions about what causes it to be activated or how long it becomes activated for, the strength of that activity, all sorts of things in these very cool worms. So using these techniques and many others, we have identified the neurochemicals that are required for the sensitization of pain receptors in worms. And some of these neurochemicals are also found in us. So what I want to know more about is how pain sensitization works at a really fundamental level, at a really basic level, and use this information to try and help people who suffer with long lasting pain. Now I want to tell you a little bit about another story. Decision making. How does it work? Just a very brief scientific story. But first I need to tell you a bit more about worms. So worms have two sexes. Unlike us, who have um, XY or XX um, or X0 or X or you know, many combinations of X's and Y's, worms only have an X chromosome. So if you have two X chromosomes, you are a hermaphrodite and you make both oocytes and sperm. So you have both male and female gonads. There are also a small proportion of worms that are X nothing, and these are males, and they make only sperm. So this means that a hermaphrodite can make progeny or make babies by reproducing by self-fertilization. So it has both eggs and sperm, so it can make clones of itself. Super cool. Or it can also mate with a male to get the male sperm. So it can make cross progeny as well. Now the male does not have these two options. It can only reproduce by mating with a hermaphrodite. So the male has a really strong evolutionarily in evolutionary pressure to find a mate to pass on its genes so, so that's what we were looking at so what we were interested in is that this particular chemical here it's a very long name so i won't read it out to you but we gave it a short name called luri one l-u-r-y-a-m-i luri one so we looked at luri one in worms and this is a very ancient neurochemical that is made by many, 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 many ancient animals, including starfish. And we were so interested in what this chemical does in the brain. It's made in all of these very ancient animal brains, even snails and sea slugs. So we looked at it in, in the worm. So we found that it's made in a, what is called a pharyngeal neuron that controls eating. Now this we saw in both males and hermaphrodites. However, when we looked at their tail, we found that in the male specifically, but not the hermaphrodite, there was additional um, near Luri-1 being made in the tail. So this was surprising to us because the tail is used for mating. So we thought, okay, so that means that this chemical in males specifically affects feeding and mating. So why is this important? As I said, males have a huge pressure to find a mate but they also need to keep themselves alive so what we are showing here um, in, a, in, a, in a study from quite a while ago now is that if you give males the option to choose between food and mating they will leave a food patch to go and search for mates so that means that they prioritize finding a mate over finding food what we found is that males without this Luri-1 chemical eat less and make better. So that prioritization might be shifted. So we are wondering if signaling by this chemical controls that decision between finding food and finding mates, which, you know, it's a worm. It doesn't have a lot going for it. So these are the two most important things it looks like. And I think it's super cool that we could find a chemical that might control this decision, this super important decision for the animal. Okay, so that's me talking about my science. Now I want to talk a little bit about my science journey. It's not terribly exciting, but like I said, I didn't know that I was going to be a scientist when I was a kid. What I did know, however, was that I was extremely curious about everything. I asked questions about everything and I wanted answers. 
So when I was in school, I did basically all the science and math subjects because they were the things that kind of gave me the satisfaction of finding questions that, you know, asking questions and finding answers. I then went to university um, where I did a, just a Bachelor of Science. Um, I couldn't decide what type of science I loved the most, so I just did everything. And in the end, during uni, I decided to major in biochemistry and immunology. And this was a decision I didn't make before university. It was a decision I made during university. And part of this is because um, my parents were, were absolutely wonderful. They were very invested in my education, but they didn't really know how university worked. So they felt like they couldn't really advise me. And that was fine. So I just went to uni and did all the subjects I loved the most and then decided what I wanted to major in at the time. And it was extremely flexible. Um, I then decided I love science so much, I was going to do it for another few years, another few years of study, so I did a PhD in genetics. I then decided to move to another country so I could study something a bit different, but still using worms. And I did this in um, Cambridge in the United Kingdom, I studied neuroscience as a postdoctoral fellow. Um, I then came back to Australia where I worked at the South Coast in New South Wales as my first scientist job where I got to teach people about science and also do a little bit of warm research. And right now I'm in my second scientist job in Adelaide in South Australia. So I've had a, you know, in a journey where I've moved around a lot. Um, I've studied different types of science, but I always find myself still fascinated by this concept of asking and answering interesting questions. So I'm just gonna finish by telling you a few things about my journey in science. So I feel that my journey in science has helped me learn lots of new skills. Now this is a video I'm gonna show you, so me injecting DNA into a worm. Now this worm is a millimeter in length, a millimeter, that's a tenth of a centimeter. So I'm using a microscope here to stick a small needle into the worm and just inject a tiny volume into it. Now this skill might not be useful for basically any other career, but it's taught me that, you know, this is something I could never believe I could do. It's a highly technical skill and now I'm good at it. So that's cool to me. I've also traveled the world and it might seem that these photos all show the same place. Believe me, they are not. It's just that university campuses around the world all basically look the same. But I've traveled all over the world, meeting great people and studying science and that is amazing. I've also met wonderful people who I've worked with um, in England, in, in um, Wollongong, and currently this is my current team in South Australia. And it is wonderful to, to be around people who are also so interested in understanding the world around us. So lastly, what do you need to be a good scientist? Now, this is just my perspective, of course, and a lot of people think that scientists have to be super smart, have to get like all the, you know, A grades, high distinctions and all of that in school. And okay, maybe it helps, but I don't think it's the most important thing. I think the most important thing to be a good scientist is curiosity. You have to want to know the answers, but you also just want to have to want to know more about the world we live in to be interested in why things are and to question why things are. And lastly, you can't be a good scientist without wanting to do good, to help people and the planet that we live in. So why do I love my job? Well, I feel the best thing about my job is I get to wake up in the morning, go to work and work on the most interesting things that I can think of. And I don't think there are many jobs that allow you to do that. So that is why I love my job as a neuroscientist. So I think that is all that I have time for. So I am more than willing to answer all your lovely questions and I look forward to hearing more from all of you. So that's where I will end and I'll stop sharing now. Thanks so much, Yi. That was so interesting. Um, thank you very much. Now we do have a couple of questions that came through Q&A, if you're happy to answer them. So the first one is, do any of the worms ever escape from your experiment? That is a great question. And I have to say that the escape rate is currently still 0%. And let me tell you the reason for this. So if you work with other animals that, you know, hop around or, or fly, 
um, there is always the chance that they will escape. But the thing about worms is they crawl and they're extremely sensitive to dryness. So if I remove them from the agar plate on which they normally live, they dry out within two minutes. So unfortunately, they don't really escape. The only way they could escape is if I took a plate of worms, went outside, stuck them into the soil, and just like waited. That's the only way. And and so far, we are we are not allowed to do that. So. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you for explaining that. And yes, please keep your questions coming, everyone. So the next one is, is it true that you can cut a worm in half and the two halves of the worms can live? See, we, we expect you to be a worm expert. <laughs> so, so, um, so with the worms that I work with, that is not the case. But there are, there are some other worms in other species where that is possible. And that's only possible because they have basically the ability to replenish their own bodies with the inf genetic information that they hold in all of their cells. Now, mm -hmm. our worms do not have that power, unfortunately. And I have to say, I've, I've cut several worms in half and they have not grown into two worms. So it doesn't happen for all the worms, unfortunately. All right. So the next one is, does the size of the worm matter when you're experimenting on it? Yeah. So that's a great question because we have um, the worms have a life cycle um, in which they go from an egg to an egg laying adult in the case of the hermaphrodites. So they take maybe mm, four days, so shall we say, to go from egg to an egg laying adult. And as they proceed through development, they get they get bigger. So they start off very small. The egg is so tiny, you can only see it down the microscope. And the adult is much bigger, and that's one millimeter. So we normally work with the adults, partly because they've stopped growing and also because they are bigger. So one millimeter is, is quite small, but that's at least big enough for us to work with. So yes, the size does matter in many cases and we try to work with the bigger ones. Okay, all right. So how do they mate with their tails? Someone's great, asked. Great question. So, so as you may have seen, the worms don't exactly have eyes. So they can't see where they're going. Um, whereas, um, however, they are incredible at sensing the smells and tastes in their environment. So what the male worms do is they can sense the hermaphrodite coming through like a combination of smells and pheromones. And their tail is an exquisite sensory organ. It has this like really sensitive touch receptors that when it makes contact with the hermaphrodite's body and basically scans it until it finds the place where it can, it can um, you know, properly mate. So it's, it's just incredible. They can do all of this without seeing what's going on. Wow, that's really impressive. Thank you so much. And sorry, everyone, we are needing to wrap up by 12. So I'm just going to thank everyone who joined us today. And thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. Yi. It's been really good um, to see so many people tuning in. And this series of talks was supported by the Victorian College and Enrichment Series. So don't forget to fill out your feedback form, which you'll receive after this session. And remember that the Shape Your Future series will be continuing all this year. So you can tune in to hear from many more scientists. All the information is also on the Stella and ATSI website. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again, you. Have a lovely day, everyone.